Welcome to Tech Gaming. My name is Tom, and this is episode four of my Terraforming Tips and Tricks series, a series where I'll cover everything you need to know about terraforming. This series will lay the foundations for my future videos to ensure that when I do get into my design theory and advanced planning techniques, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about and how to do it for yourself. I just want to start off this episode by quickly saying a huge thanks when I read your comments or even get a notification saying that you've subscribed. It's truly awesome to know that I've inspired you or I've successfully passed on my valuable learning experiences or even just entertained you for a few minutes. I am humbled that you chose to stick with me here at Tech Gaming. But what I really wanna say is that the focus of my videos aren't to flaunt what I know. The purpose of my content has always been to teach and to motivate. It isn't meant to be competitive and you don't have to play 10 hours a day. That's the choice that I've made. I just want to remind you that your island is your island. You can do whatever you want with your island so long that it satisfies you and you're happy with what you've done. I know you've put so much effort and time into it so far, so you should be proud with what you've made, the mistakes and experiments you've attempted, and what you're capable of making. Just give it some time and don't give up on it. So with the skills and techniques and tips that I hope you find useful in my videos, I hope to help you make the island that you've always envisioned. So if you're new to tech gaming, I'd love nothing more than to talk to you. I wanna know any particular goals you have for your island, whether that be a theme, develop a certain area of the island, or something you wanna learn more of in the comment section down below. Consider subscribing if you think the videos I make are worth your time and investment, and if you enjoy the community I'm trying to build. It's people like these, and possibly you, that helps me grow and push myself to offer better content each and every video. Right, let's get into episode four, where I will break down in detail everything you need to know about paths in Animal Crossing New Horizons on the Nintendo Switch. I said this would be a big one, so feel free to prepare yourselves, pause the video, go to the bathroom, grab a snack and a drink and get comfy. More importantly, if you wanna get the most out of what I'm teaching here, it would be a good idea to actively participate in the video and you can do this by playing the game and attempting to do these mechanics while I walk you through it. The best way to learn is of course to attempt it yourself. As always, let's start off with the basics and build up from them. Paths in Animal Crossing New Horizons have got to be the most versatile design mechanic in the entire game. The ability to visually change the aesthetic of the ground plays a huge role in the overall design and theme of your island. Paths are unlocked the same time you get terraforming permits after you've completed the quest chain from Tom Nook. That is, once you get KK Slider to visit your island for the first time. You only start with a few path designs, but the rest of them, including the custom QR path tile, are accessible and ready for purchase using Nook Miles from the rewards app on the ATM inside Resident Services. Now, let's quickly cover how they work. Paths are accessed via the terraforming application on your Nook phone. Now, this is the really easy part. Select the path you want to lay down and use the tool to apply a single path tile on the grid directly in front of you. Repeat the process to extend the path and widen the path in a grid-like fashion. Now, paths can be removed simply by using the same button that added the path or using the grass tile, which is an eraser tool, more or less. They can be shaped and curved, but I'll cover this later in greater detail. I need to first explain how I personally define the importance of paths. If you take to heart my reasoning I'm about to share with you, I promise it will help you with the overall design of your island. So, paths should be used as a directive tool. And what I mean by this is, Use them to guide visitors and your own villagers to places you want them to actively go and participate in. Now, this may seem straightforward, but let's give it a little bit more thought than this. If you fall into the, I'm struggling with how to plan my overall placement of structures and areas for my island category, then you need to pay closer attention to this part. Let's explain what I call the tourist guide method. I want you to imagine that you are a tourist guide on your very own island. Now, 100% of us have all the same permanent structures, resident services, nooks, cranny, campsite, museum, you get what I'm saying here. The difference is the journey to these places. Every single island starts in the same place. Getting off the plane at Dal Airport. Now, the real difference is that as a tour guide, you get to decide what route you wanna take your visitors around these certain structures and paths is the key method into you shaping your island and doing this. Now, don't get me confused here. The design choice comes down to you and what style of island you're going for, but I know some friends with amazing islands that use little quote unquote physical pathing, but have an amazing flow in terms of direction to their island. So to sum everything up, consider defining the term path as more or less a way in which you direct others around your island and its spaces. Now I'm gonna categorize the term paths into four very distinguishable groups. 
This is to acknowledge their versatility and usability in various methods. Category 1. Paths as, well, paths or walkways. As I said earlier, they serve the primary functionality of directing someone to a certain location, through a certain area, or providing visitors with a choice. Should I go this way, or this way, or this way? Now, keep in mind the absence of a path is just as plausible of a design choice, but more on that later in the design series after this one. Category two is paths as design areas and spaces. Now this one is still pretty straightforward. The utilization of paths in a larger area to form functional spaces such as a courtyard to a garden bed is quite relevant and plays a huge role in your design aesthetic overall on your island. Category three, paths as visual details and accents. The use of paths underneath items and furniture, visual details such as riding in the sand on the beach, to custom QR paths to add depth and personality to your island theme. Lastly, category four, paths that serve as game mechanic functions such as spawn blocking, opening a spawn up, or used as a measuring tool. Awesome, now that we know each category, let's go into greater detail. Back to category one, paths as walkways. Your main use of paths will be walkways that connect and direct visitors and villagers. Here are the three main essential tips for using paths in this way. Tip number one, first determine the locations of your permanent buildings. Remember how I mentioned this problem in my previous bridges video? Well, here's what you gotta do. To do this, start by determining the route or route, however you wanna pronounce it, from the entrance to whichever structure you want. Note that I didn't explicitly say resident services. Now, the main mistake that I often see on other people's islands is that they lack diversification. Now, to make your island different, Consider various options in which way you want to direct your visitors and why you want them to go there first. Maybe you want a huge area dedicated to the museum and its various displays. Your entrance could direct them through that area first. Maybe you could direct the visitors to a welcoming courtyard that splits off into various directions to give them choices on where to go. Or maybe you're focused on the trade and online connectivity so you may want to consider having a trade area or an open space to do deals and trades and drop-offs and pickups. Tip number two, path size and length. Consider various sizing in terms of width and the length you want people to travel to each destination. This is a huge factor in determining the overall size of your island and how full or open it may feel. Consider a three to five tile wide path. This indicates a sense of a main road often traveled to main places of interest, like your shops and other permanent structures. In comparison to a one to two tile wide path, often feels like a road less traveled, perhaps a secret entrance to a private beach or space, like a garden or a cafe. Tip number three, consider the destination of that path. Remember, the main purpose of a path is to guide and direct your visitors to a certain area. It defeats the purpose of having a path if you haven't planned on having it lead to somewhere in the first place. Remember, Paths don't necessarily need to use connecting design tiles. Sometimes the absence of tiles and the use of trees, flowers, and other items are a better option for directing someone to a certain location. Or you could even mix up the style, which leads me to tip number four, design options with paths. The possibilities of path designs are endless, and let me get this clear. You can use custom design path tile options from QR codes to spruce up every now and again, but there is nothing wrong with the in-game design options such as the stones, the bricks, and even the sand and dirt tile options. My main advice to you as a designer is to simply experiment. If you don't like it, rip it up and try it again. Try mixing options with various tiles for certain circumstances and area design options. Whether you're going for a more civilized feel with the brick pattern or stone pattern, or you wanna go for a more natural feel with dirt patterns, sand patterns, or lack of pattern altogether and just have grass. Consider the tile layout options as well. Staggering stone paths may be better than having a path altogether or layering tile designs on top of each other. You could simply use a brick tile option and then use the custom QR tile on top of that to add depth and perspective to your design. And lastly, tip number five, path perspective. I struggled early with creating visual interest and lack detail, but that is easily solved by utilizing the game perspective to your advantage. Let the game do the heavy lifting for you and rely on the camera's perspective when moving along a path. Remember that the camera will maintain the same position and perspective regardless of where you walk. The most beautiful of perspectives, in my opinion, 
is the game's dynamic revolving camera as you walk north or south. The horizon magically appears in a slow revealing fashion. Paths that are slowly revealed by the camera as you walk along create a beautiful sense of journey from destination to destination. This camera perspective goes hand in hand with the environment around it, often accentuating things like trees in a row, flower garden beds, items that you've displayed, and so on and so forth. Category two, paths as design spaces. I have three tips for you here. Tip number one, plan out the border of your designated area with path tiles first. You can visualize the space and how many tiles you want to dedicate to this certain area by considering what will go into the space. For example, if it's a cafe, break it down further by outlining the spaces for the stall and the spaces for the sitting area. You should know first how many tables and chairs you want to fit and will often give you the measurements without guessing. For example, a small table and two chairs will require three adjacent tile spaces. Want to use a set of trees to separate the space between the path and the entryway? Then sure, you're gonna to need to dedicate a three x three tile grid space for the tree to sufficiently grow. Tip number two, floor design. With this one, your design intentions will often follow the things you cannot change. These being the permanent structures that you dedicate the space to and the overall theme of the space. Looking at these features, your design options will stem from their existing characteristics. Remember, tie in themes across your entire island. Perhaps you will use the stone tiles for both the Nook's Cranny and the Able Sisters to represent a shopping district. Which fence have you used and how does that look with the path tile you've chosen? Again, experimenting is essential as you will only know how it looks once you've attempted it. Tip number three, path patterns. This is where your taste in design really shows. Perhaps you want a solid courtyard, then a basic field area with tiles is the way to go. Maybe you want a more elaborate feature floor to compensate for the lack of items present, then consider using custom QR paths. This will help you tell a story with the space, which is one of the biggest design features I will cover in my design series later on the channel. Or you could opt to shape the path into circles and bends and various patterns. There are heaps of ways to do this. Four tile grid spaces, for example, can be turned into a circle by rounding off path tile edges and paths can be curved and removed without losing the design by using the cliff building permit. You simply add land and then remove it and it will not affect the surrounding curved tiles, leaving a unique design like this one you see here in my garden. Again, it all comes down to experimenting and the opportunity for you to try new things out. So don't be afraid to experiment because you never know, it might look good and it might not. Which brings us to category three, paths as visual details and accents. And I have two tips for you on this one. Tip number one, let the items going into the space guide your decision on what path to use or the absence of paths. So many items in the game are made up of the very same textures and materials as the paths. This cannot be any more true when it comes to things like bridges and inclines. Simple things like putting stone tiles underneath street lamps or dirt underneath flowers often heighten the visual aesthetic of the object you place. Tip number two, visual detail goes a long way in helping tell the story in that particular area. Perhaps you have a beach gym like I do. I use the custom QR tile to place an inscription written in the sand and this is to just give the place a little bit more character. Or maybe you have a stone path alongside a river. Try adding another layer on top of the stones, like some moss as a custom QR tile to provide a little bit more detail as well. If you're ever stuck with what to do, use real life as an inspiration. I've seen some amazing islands that recreate urban environments, basing their paths to represent roads and even gutters. Again, the more detail you have in that area, the better the story you're going to be able to tell. Lastly, category four, paths that serve as game mechanic functions. And I have three tips here. Tip number one, using the transparent color available on the color palette in custom designs, you can create something called an invisible tile. Now this is an awesome way of blocking things such as weed spawns in certain areas and saves you from putting an item there or a visible path such as stone, etc., etc. You can also use this on top of dirt, sand and grass and to help you avoid even fossil spawns. Tip number two, opening a spawn up for something that only belongs in a certain area. Now the best example I can give you is my rock farm tutorial and allowing coconut trees on the main island. Simply place sand down as a single tile and with the right validated space, you can appropriately grow a coconut tree that usually can only be grown on the beach. 
And finally, tip number three, using paths as a measuring tool. This ties in well with all the categories I've already spoken about, as using paths is a great way to carefully plan out how much space is needed for a certain area. Feel free to use either method, the shovel method that I've spoken about in my previous videos, or this one. And wow, you did it. That's everything I believe you should know about paths. There is so much more I could explain, but they will pop up in later design videos after this series. I will leave you with a few design ideas for paths. How about creating custom doormats for each villager house? It only requires six tiles, which is three tiles long by two tiles wide, and you can make them to your own liking. What about the use of text on the ground to represent entry and exit points in lines? Or how about paths being used to simulate a sporting ground like a basketball court or a soccer field? The possibilities are endless. Again, I want to leave you with a final tip, which is just experiment and try something out. If it works for you, then that's all that matters. So that concludes episode four of my terraforming tips and tricks series. I really, really hope that you got something out of this one. It took a lot of time and effort trying to put this one together because it's almost at that 20 minute mark. But thank you so much for sticking around and watching this video. I really appreciate time that you took out of your day to watch my video. I really do appreciate it. If you have any other questions or concerns regarding paths or something that you want to tell me, pop in in the comment sections down below and look forward to episode five where we finally get to cover the permits, both the waterscaping and cliff construction permits. So stick around on TAC Gaming if you enjoy what I am creating for you. I hope to see you in my other videos. And with that, continue to enjoy your island life.